Good morning. And whether you're watching online or you're here in the sanctuary, welcome to Northwest Barrie United Church on the first of three Christmas Eve services today. See how many are in it for the long haul today. And I got to tell you, looking out today, a lot of questionable fashion choices have been made. You get a chance to look at Jerry's sweater, it does flash at you quite a bit. We're going to begin the service with our gathering song. It's number 35 in Voices United, Let Christian Friends Rejoice. I think we're going to sing two verses in Greek. Let's see what the screen says. Well, good morning, everyone. And I think I can say Merry Christmas, right? Merry Christmas. We're so thrilled that you're here today. And to everybody watching online, we're great to, great to have you with us as well. As Steve said, today is just the opening act of a very long day. So um, I hope you'll join us for one, two, or all three of our services. More that to come in a moment. But we always like to begin by saying good morning to anybody who might be visiting. Or if you're celebrating today, uh, and we'd love to know what you're celebrating. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, my caller here from Hamilton Major, retired Major Jerry Vanfield. Retired Major from Hamilton, happy to have you here. Jane. Hi, Jane. Has a birthday in 1914, and Malcolm turns 10. Woo! Fancy. I've got all my family here from Ottawa. Your sister has a birthday in three days. Awesome. Happy birthday. Yeah. That's it. Well, it's nice. Dave. Uh, Jennifer's mother is doing a pop teacher. Yes, we're going to have a happy year. Jennifer's mother is doing a pop teacher. And I have to say how much I, as Steve said, I do love all the, uh, the red and green out there, the different kinds of sweaters, except for one. Brian, can you stand up for a second? <laughs> now that's an ugly Christmas sweater. <laughs> Eleanor. It's, uh, it's not such a happy news, but um, my mom fell ill and, and died uh, very suddenly. So we're not celebrating, but we are celebrating the wonderful uh, life that she had and uh, the fact that she lives to see our kids and be a big part of their lives. Well, our love to you. Thank you. I think if there might be a couple of... Are there announcements this morning or, or not? If they are, could anybody come up and share them? Great, okay. I have just a couple. Um, first of all, I hope when you came in, you enjoyed uh, the snacks. Those are on behalf of our worship team, so I'd like to say thank you to, uh, to, to that team for, for preparing that. So that means that there's no coffee hour after church. We just invite you to go on your way and get ready for uh, the rest of uh, the day for, for Christmas coming. Um, again, we have two services tonight. If you like your Christmas Eve service with Angels and Shepherds, then come at 6.30. Uh, if you like a Christmas Eve service a little quieter with the candlelight and communion, then come at 10. If you like both, please come out to both. We'd love to have you. So that takes place tonight. Also invite you to come back next Sunday, which is New Year's Eve. We're going to have a special service. I'm going to be sharing the last of my series called Are You Serious? We're going to talk about the wise men. Also on that day, we're going to have our wish stars. So for those of you who are new to Northwest, every year at the beginning of January, we give out wish stars, and every star has a different word on it. You randomly pick it, and that becomes your guiding word for the year. So we hope you'll come out next Sunday be part of that. If you can't be here next Sunday, we will have the stars for a couple weeks after that as well. And finally, I just want to say thank you to my, uh, my colleagues, my fellow staff members here at Northwest. This is what we call a perfect storm when Christmas Eve lands on a Sunday. Um, so I just want to say thank you for all the amazing amount of work that has gone into preparing all of these services, whether we're up the front uh, leading our music program or running the pageant or if we're in the office or the nursery doing our work there or whether we're putting the PowerPoint together doing a live stream. It's been an amazing uh, commitment by our staff. So thank you to Chris, Daniel, Lori, Sharon, Sherry, and Catherine for all the work that they've done. Let's begin our service now with our call to worship. It's Christmas Eve. Welcome to the sights of Christmas. Welcome to the sounds of Christmas. The excited shower of children, voices raised in prayer and song. Welcome to the touch of Christmas. Hands and hugs extended in welcome. Welcome to the heart of Christmas. Let us celebrate the child of God, born in a manger, and alive in our hearts. Our opening hymn is the first four verses of the first Noel. Let us stand and sing together. <laughs>
this. I invite you to join me in our opening prayer as, as it's on the screen. Let us offer this prayer together and let us pray. God of new birth, God of new life, we thank you for this special and exciting Sunday of worship. Around us are the symbols of hope, joy, and love, the symbols of Christmas. May the spirit of Christmas be felt today in the music and message that celebrates Christ's birth. May the excitement and wonder of Christmas invite us into the mystery of your presence around us. And may we leave with peace in our hearts and a song of joy on our lips. For Christmas is coming, a time for love, laughter, and new life. Amen. This morning we're going to light the fourth of our candles, and it's the, the candle of love. What is love? Love is the gathering of people we care about the most. Love is the giving and receiving of thoughtful gifts. Love is reaching out to somebody at this season who may feel alone. And love is the child, born in a manger who was wanted and loved, and who in return shared that love with the world. Maya Angelou wrote some of her most beautiful poems about the triumph of love. So we're going to end our season, Advent season, with the sharing of her poem on love. We, unaccustomed to courage, exiles from delight, live coiled in shells of loneliness until love leaves its high, holy temple and comes into our sight to liberate us into life. Love arrives, and in its train come ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet if we are bold, love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity in the flush of love's light. We dare be brave, and suddenly we see that love costs all we are and will ever be. Yet it is only love which sets us free. We're going to sing the last verse of um, Hope is a Star, and as we do so, I'm going to invite the Jones boys, Charlie, Henry, and James, to come up and help me light the Advent candles.
thank you to our choir, and thank you, Sashidi, for uh, accompanying today. I know we've got lots of kids here, which is awesome, and I hope you'll come up for a few minutes and join me right up at the front here. I will make it worth your what? You guys can sit right on, right on the stairs, too, if you want to. As long as you can see the screen, you can sit anywhere. And people are going to be moving furniture behind me, so just ignore what's going on there, because that's for something later on. Yeah. So, how are you guys doing? Scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you? 9? 9? Nine? Nine. Nine. 8? Nine. 10, thank you! There's one ten. There's got to be more than one ten. Okay, you think about it, Dougie. I gotta keep going. Right on. Okay. Well said. Thank you. So, guys, I want to talk to you today about we all have things that we love about Christmas. We all have some symbols of Christmas. We look around the church. There's symbols of Christmas. There's poinsettias, which is a symbol. There's the Advent candles. Anything? Any other symbols that you see? The tree, the angel on top of the tree is a symbol. Anybody else? What do you, else do you see? Thea? Dougie? The The cross, yeah. That could be a symbol for sure. Anybody else? The present behind the tree, yep. Yeah. I want to show you a symbol of Christmas for me. Do you ever know what that is? Orange. It's actually a clementine. So it's a type of orange. And so there's a, I'm from England, and there's a tradition in England that when you would put your stockings out, the, the thing that would go right at the very foot of the stocking would always be an orange or a clementine. And then you'd open up your gifts in the stocking, and sand would always leave that right at the very foot of the orange. So this reminds me of being a kid, how excited Christmas is, and, and opening up stockings and gifts and all the fun parts of Christmas. But I think this has another uh, meaning as well. Um, but I have to peel it to show you what that meaning is. So. Uh, while I'm peeling it, because it takes me a few minutes to do this, why don't we watch a little video? We've been watching clips from favorite movies from uh, the holidays, so let's watch a little clip from, it's about four minutes long, from The Grinch, and then I'll explain how this Clementine has a lot to do with The Grinch. Okay? Everybody watch. sounded glad. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes or bags. He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzle of a saw. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more.
and Ben, while well, in Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then the true meaning of Christmas came through and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches plus two. And now that his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light. With a smile in his soul, he descended Mount Crumpet, cheerily blowing hoo-hoo on his trumpet. He rode into Whoville, he brought back their toys, he brought back their floof to the Who girls and boys. He brought back their snoop and their tringlers and fuzzles, brought back their pantookas, their dafflers and wuzzles. He brought everything back, all the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. Welcome, Christmas. Bring your cheer. Cheer to all who's far and near. Christmas Day is in our grasp, so long as we have hands to clasp. Christmas Day will always be just as long as we have we. Welcome Christmas while we stand, heart to heart and hand in hand. Everybody knows that movie, right? Everybody out there knows that movie, right? So the Grinch decided he was going to take Christmas away because he was just grouchy, he didn't like people celebrating, and then suddenly he realized that there's maybe something more. Let's go back to my orange. I think about it this way. An orange is great. The outside is great. It looks great. But what you really want is what's on the inside. That's the really good stuff. I think about the orange peels as kind of the things like, these are gifts and stockings and the food of Christmas and the treats and all the things that we enjoy. And they're important and they're good too. But what's really important is what's at the core of Christmas. And that is one word. Anybody know what that word is? Love. Love, right. Christmas is a celebration of love. The greatest gift that you guys are going to have this Christmas is spending it with the people that you love the most. I hope you're able to do that. So I hope you have a great Christmas. I hope it's full, not just of all of this stuff, but the good stuff inside the love as well. Okay? Merry Christmas, everybody. You can follow Lori and have fun in Sunday school. Thanks, Dougie. Appreciate it. Thank you. And let us now continue to worship God as we present and dedicate our morning offering.
in this season of giving, we know that the real gifts, the most valuable gifts, are the gifts of hope and peace and joy and love. In our celebrations, may we be generous in sharing those gifts within our homes and within our community and within our world. May you bless these gifts and those who give them in your name. Amen. I'm going to begin this part of the service by sharing just a very small part of the Christmas story. Sorry for those who can't see me behind the tree. I'll try to move around a little bit. I'm reading this from the King James Version of the Bible. The only time in the year you'll hear me read from the King James Version of the Bible way back in the 1500s, but the language is beautiful. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. Amen. So in place of a traditional sermon or message this morning, I'm going to do something different. I hope you enjoy it. If you want to hear a sermon, you've got to come tonight at 10 o'clock. If you don't, lucky you. In, 1950, in 1957, the Ascension Lutheran Church in Danville, Virginia, added something new to their celebration of Advent. They brought a Christmas tree into the sanctuary and covered it with special three-dimensional symbols and monograms. The organizer, a Mrs. Frances Spencer, created these ornaments and called them chrismons, a word she coined combining the two words Christ and monogram. The idea caught on and spread, and soon other congregations were using Christmas as part of their worship and celebrations around Christmas. Today, congregations across the United States and the United Kingdom hold Christmas services, usually on Christmas Eve. The tradition is just beginning to take root here in Canada. This is the second time we've done this at Northwest. The first time was back in 2017, when the church last had a Christmas Eve morning service. And the idea behind it is to share some of the historic symbols of our faith, some of which go back to the beginning of the church over 2,000 years ago. Did my microphone just cut out? Can we use this one? So I hope you will learn something as we hang these symbols on our Christmas tree. Thank you to those who volunteered to hang a symbol. <laughs> I invite you to come forward when you're asked to do so, and by the end, our tree will be covered with some of the ancient symbols of our Christian faith. The symbols are divided into five different sets, and between each set, we will sing a couple of verses of a Christmas song. The first set of chrismons are known as secret chrismons. In the early years of the church following the life of Jesus, early believers had to practice their faith in secret. They faced persecution and sometimes martyrdom. And so three symbols developed that Christians used to let other Christians know that they were in good company. The first is the cross and the anchor. The first chrismon is the cross and anchor. In the early days when Christians were persecuted for their faith, they had to meet in secret. The anchor with a cross hidden in it was a secret sign that people would put on their doors to show that other Christians were welcome within the home. The second one is the fish. When it was illegal to be Christian, people not only put the cross anchor on their doors, but they developed a code to tell who was a believer and who was not. One person would draw an oblong arc, and if you were a Christian, you would draw the rest of the arc to create a fish. If you weren't, you wouldn't know that, and so you would know that they weren't a Christian. It was to provide safety from those who might be trying to infiltrate these early Christians. Today, the, the fish is still a symbol of Christianity all over the world. 
And the third one is the boat. Ancient Christians met in the catacombs of Rome. Artists painted on the walls of the catacombs and were fond of painting ships gliding through troubled waters, the cross forming its sail. As a symbol of the church, the ship reminded early Christians that in spite of persecution, those who were faithful could endure and get to the other side. So if you have a blue chrismon with you, an anchor, a fish, or a boat, I'm going to invite you to come and put it on the tree, and we're going to sing the first two verses, Remain Seated in the Bleak Midwinter. on to Lori, who of course took it into Sunday school. So anyways, imagine it's on the tree. The next set are called the natural chrismons. As many of us feel, our faith is not just nurtured in church, but also in the natural world. Over the years, the church has used what they call natural symbols to share the story of our faith. And there are six of them. The first is the Rose of Sharon. In the Old Testament, Solomon described the Savior as the Rose of Sharon. Sharon is a plant, one of the largest valley plants in Palestine. Back in the time of Solomon, it was considered to be a flower of the kings. Sharon is known for its beauty and its majesty. The rose of Sharon is meant to remind us that where there is beauty in the world, there is God. The second one is the shell. The shell is traditionally a symbol of baptism. In the church, it's also a symbol of water. And it's a symbol of perseverance. Life is like the tides of an ocean. Fate and opportunity, hardship and turmoil come in and go like the ocean tides. But each time the tide recedes, it leaves behind a treasure in the form of shells. So too, when we persevere through the challenges of life, each one can leave behind its own treasure of a lesson learned. So the shell reminds us to trust that even in difficult times, we learn to grow and we get stronger. The third is the thistle, and it's a unique symbol of our faith. On the one hand, it's prickly, and touching it could hurt, and yet it produces some beautiful flowers. A thistle is meant to remind us that where there is pain, there can also be beauty. And in the ancient church, thistles were often gathered on Easter as a symbol of the crown of thorns of Jesus' head, but also as hope that from suffering can come new life. Fourth is the dove. Long before the coming of Jesus, the dove was a symbol used in ancient religious traditions and usually represented the feminine expression of faith. In ancient Mesopotamia, the dove symbolized the mother goddess. At the baptism of Jesus, it says that a dove came down from heaven as he was being baptized, representing the Spirit of God. And so in the early church, the dove became a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Today, it's a universal symbol of peace. It reminds us that our faith is committed to finding peace, peace around us and peace within us. Number five is the lamb. The sacrifice of lambs played a very important role in religious life in ancient Israel. It may seem strange to us today, but the Israelites sacrificed lambs every morning and every night at the temple. It was believed the lamb stood for the sins of the people, 
When they killed the lamb, they were, in a sense, killing their sins. Thankfully, such modern-day sacrifices don't happen, at least here. But the lamb remains a symbol of that sacrifice and of God's forgiveness. Today, a lamb is also a symbol of innocence and vulnerability. As a shepherd cares for a lamb, so we care for one another. And finally, the butterfly. In classical Greece and Rome, it was believed the soul of the body left in the form of a butterfly. The Aztecs and Aborigines also imagined the soul as a butterfly. For Christians, the butterfly is a symbol for new life. It first came to prominence in the Middle Ages, when in some churches, butterflies were incorporated into the stonework of cathedrals, subtle symbols of the resurrection to new life. Today, the butterfly represents transformation and of the belief that we can all die to our old selves and to old ways of living and become something new. So if you have a green chrismon of a rose, shell, thistle, dove, lamb, or butterfly, please come and bring it on the tree, and we're going to sing while shepherds watch their flocks. Chrismons. There is no symbol more associated with our faith than the cross. Over the years, there have been many depictions of the cross, and here are four of the most famous. The first is the cross with IC, XC, and Nika on it. The IC and XC are the first and last letters of the Greek words for Jesus and Christ, and Nika is connected to the word for victory, which is a word straight from Greek mythology. If you own Nike shoes or clothes, it comes from that same word, Nika, meaning victory. It was incorporated into Christianity with the idea that Jesus is victorious over the systems of death, evil, power, and oppression in the world. The second is the Greek cross. The Greek cross is made of equal length crossbars. The Greek cross is one of the earliest Christian crosses. It was not intended to represent the cross of the crucifixion, but instead the four directions of the earth where the gospel was to be spread and also the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. The Greek cross is a popular floor plan for Eastern churches. Many e Greek churches are built with the cross four equal points in every direction. And third is the Latin cross. The Latin cross with its upright crossbar is the form of cross that Jesus was most likely crucified on. That's why it became the most popular symbol of Christianity. It's often depicted on a three-tier platform, which represents the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And finally, the Celtic cross. The Celtic cross, of course, has a ring around it. It emerged in Ireland and Britain in the early Middle Ages. And although scholars aren't sure of the exact origin of the Celtic cross, popular theory holds that St. Patrick himself introduced the symbol of the cross. The people at the time worshipped other gods, one of which was the sun god. And so St. Patrick, in an attempt to appeal to those who worship folk traditions, drew a circle around the cross to show the sun god and the Christian god were the same god. Others say the ring is actually a symbol of eternity or of the never-ending love which, like a circle, has no beginning and no end. It's a mystery, but there's no question that when we look at the Celtic cross, we think of Ireland and the fact that the Christian faith has many different expressions. So if you have a white chrismon, please come up and hang it on the tree, and we're going to sing the first two verses of Gentle Mary.
good attempt. That hymn is actually, it's, it's also stuck to Good King Wenceslas, and I forgot to tell you that, Chris. So we could have stuck it to Good King Wenceslas. We won't do it again, though. Number five is the light, Chris Mons, or number four. The symbol of light is powerful in our faith. Jesus is referred to the light of the world. Often the symbol for light is a star. And of course, a star figures prominently in the Christmas story. But through the years, many different types of stars have been used to symbolize our faith. Let me share with you four of them today. The first is the five-point star. It's the most common star in history, and it's been used by many different religions and organizations. It's the star that represents the Benai faith, for example. It also represents the Wiccan faith. It also represents the five virtues of ancient knighthood, friendship, generosity, chastity, courtesy, and piety. It's been used by sports organizations as a symbol of victory, such as on the jerseys of the Juventus football team. And on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, it's used to represent stardom or notoriety. But originally, for a while, it was a Christian symbol. The five points were meant to represent the five wounds of Jesus on the cross, two for his hands, two for his feet, and one for his side. The second star is the Star of David. The six-point star today is known as the Star of David is associated with Judaism. But originally, this star was found in the oldest of Christian churches. It was believed to be the signa of King Solomon. It was in the 17th century in Prague that Jews of that city started to uh, identify with the six-point cross. But it was after World War I when the six-point cross was used to mark the graves of fallen Jewish soldiers that it became associated exclusively with Judaism. Today it is the official symbol of Judaism and is on the flag of Israel. The third star is the eight-point star. The eight-point star originated in ancient Egypt. It symbolized the four male gods and the four female gods that were worshipped. It became a single symbol for Christianity again in the Middle Ages. It's a symbol of wisdom. The eight points are supposed to represent the eight decades of life through which we are going to live and through them to gain wisdom and faith. Today, many parts of the world, it's a symbol of good luck. For example, in many Middle Eastern traditions, eight-point stars are interwoven into carpets. It was believed to bring good luck into the house. And finally, the nativity star. This is a star that was believed to have led the wise men to the stable in Bethlehem. It's a very old symbol in our faith. It's painted with a tail thanks to a painting by a medieval painter named Giotti de Bondoni, who painted the star as a comet, and ever since has often been depicted as having a tail. So if you have a yellow chrysanthemum with a star, please come up, and we're going to sing two verses of Away in a Manger. the Christmas chrismons. First of all, the candle. Christmas comes to us in the darkest season of the year, and thus it makes sense that some of its most enduring and endearing symbols are that of light. A candle in the Christian faith reminds us of Jesus who's described as the light of the world, 
that the darkness could not overcome. Specifically at Christmas, we light candles to represent hope, peace, joy, and love, the most important qualities of a life of faith. Christmas is a celebration of light, and what better way to capture that than by the light of candles? Secondly, the angel. The angel is one of the most prominent symbols of the Christmas story. We put them on our tree. We dress them up for Christmas pageants. We sing songs about them. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. Angels were believed to be divine messengers or ambassadors of the sacred in the world. It was an angel that appeared to Mary and to the shepherds to declare the birth of Jesus. Angels remind us of the beauty of the Christmas story and of the promise that we are never alone. Just as angels are messengers to humans, they are also believed to be the guardians of humans. Christmases and angels go hand in hand. Thirdly is the shepherd's crook. Psalm 100 describes God as our shepherd, our caregiver, and our guide. In the Christmas story, it is shepherds who are summoned to the manger. The shepherd's crook is a symbol in the Christian faith of both discipline and love. It reminds us the story of Christmas is for all of us. It reminds us that God is our shepherd, our caregiver, and our guide. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, as the Bible says. Is it any wonder, then, that when the time came for Jesus to be born, the first to hear the news were the shepherds abiding in the fields? And the manger. The story from Luke's gospel that we read this morning includes while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in clothes, and placed him in a manger because there was no room at the inn. What is a manger? It's sometimes used to feed animals. The manger in the Christmas story is a reminder that the story is one of humility and grace. The child was born not to majesty, but to poverty, not to power, but to love. The manger is a symbol of all that we most cherish about the Christmas story. And finally, the heart. In the original Christmas service, the heart was the last symbol placed on the tree. It was meant to bring all the other symbols together as a reminder that what lies at the very heart of our faith since the very beginning is love. Love is the beginning and the end. So if you have a purple chrisma, please bring it forward and we'll sing a couple of verses of Joy to the World. Just want to end on a good note, didn't you, Chris? Thanks. <laughs> Let me quickly draw all of this together this morning. The purpose of the Chris ones is to remind us of the proud history of our Christian faith and how it's developed and changed throughout the years. We are a faith of symbols, each one drawing us into the heart of what we cherish. We began the service today by reminding, remembering how our ancestors had to meet in secret in order to be followers. Then we remembered how, like the Rose of Sharon, our faith brings beauty and majesty to life. In the thorn and lamb symbols, we acknowledge his suffering and sacrifice to do what's right. We embrace peace in the shape of a dove. In the butterfly, we witness the capacity to transform ourselves. Looking to the crosses, we remember that at the core of our faith is the idea that sometimes we're called to sacrifice for the greater good. And if we have the courage to let some things die, they can provide the opportunity for something else. The star Christmas remind us that we are a people of the light, and we add light to the world when we have a positive attitude and we are quick to extend mercy and kindness. As people of faith, we are led to places of, of the inner light of peace. And finally, the Christmas chrismons remind us 
that the story of Christmas is a story of peace and hope and joy and love. Christmas isn't just a day or a feeling or a moment. It is a way of being. It is a willingness to hear the call to go to places of life and opportunity. It is an invitation to birth into the world that which is good and true and honest and lasting. And it's living with an open heart, an open mind, and an open spirit that experiences the living presence of God in all that we do and in all whom we see. All of it, all of it, is what we celebrate in this season of Christmas. Amen. Let us pray. God of Christmas joy, we gather in this familiar space transformed with the symbols of the beauty of this season. May our hearts feel open today, ready to receive the gifts of Christmas. In this busy and complicated time, draw us back to the simplicity of a manger where love didn't need the trappings of gifts or decorations. It just needed arms and hearts ready to receive it. May we receive Christmas Day the same way, whether it comes to us with wild shouts of glee or quietly like the dawn of morning. May it have something for each of us. May it lift our tired spirits. May it heal our inner hurts. May it provide light to darkened corners. May it file down the calluses of negativity or grief and give us a feeling of hope for the future. Like Mary who treasured in her heart all that she saw and heard, may we treasure the moments that Christmas will bring. May we treasure the people we share it with. May we treasure the memories that it holds for us. May we treasure the meaning of a thoughtful gift or the work that went into creating a Christmas feast. May we treasure it all. And for all those traveling this Christmas, keep us safe as we reach destinations and cross thresholds of welcome. And may we also remember in prayer today those for whom Christmas is a difficult time. May their spirits find some comfort in the quiet and sacred space that Christmas Day can bring. And may we all take a moment and reach out to someone who may really value a positive message of love. And now as we continue in prayer, we lift up the prayers that we bring to worship today. God of Christmas joy, send us forward to this Christmas Eve with a joyful and joyful expectation for what is to come. And may Christmas dawn in each of our lives with the light of hope and peace. And hear us now as we continue in prayer as we sing together the Lord's Prayer. joining us today. Thank you, everybody who watched from home. I really hope you'll come out again tonight, 6.30 or 10 o'clock. Hope to see you there. We're going to end our closing hymn as As With Gladness, Men of Old. Let's stand and sing the first three verses.
from this place of worship back into the busyness of Christmas Eve. Go and wrap your gifts, defrost your turkey, do your laundry, and come back again tonight as we celebrate the gift of God's love, the child of the manger. May the joy of this day wrap us in a spirit of good and good. God's blessing and peace to you all. Merry Christmas. Amen.